great staff that uh, works so hard, so many volunteers. There's about 55 volunteers every week in one capacity or another that keep this thing rolling. You know, we have seven and a half acres, 32,000 square feet all together with the daycare, preschool, uh, Christian school, school of ministry, operation share, feeding ministry, uh, not counting all the other things, intercessory prayer and all the different things that are going on, children, jam kids, youth, Ignite, all these different things, all these different blessings, our praise and worship team. We have uh, Restoration South, which is in Woodbine, where we have our Sunday night services at 6 o'clock. Pastor Larry, the guy that got crazy up here preaching all over the place, he pastors down there and does a wonderful job. We planted five churches in Africa. There are five churches literally named Restoration Ministries in Africa this year. There's a church in Ecuador, Restoration Ecuador. So we planted actually seven churches out of our church in the first four years of existence. Our goal over the next few years is to plant 100 churches across the world that we could take the good news of Jesus and show them the love of God. Amen. And I don't know about you, but that excites me to think about what God is doing and how he is moving. And... Um, so it's an opportunity if you've been coming and you haven't got involved yet to kind of, we'll have each different uh, leaders of our ministry will be in the back and they'll, they'll be there to explain the different things that are going on and you can pray about it and maybe the Lord would lay it upon your heart to get involved. You have an opportunity to do so if you would like and you know, if you've heard of this and you heard of that and you didn't really know what it was, today will be the opportunity for you to find out. I've preached to you this year so far about a year of, of value, how we are valuable to God, a year of no fear. You know, we talked about that, and there's been different things. We talked uh, uh, different weeks about uh, a year of no assumption. You know, the devil wants you to assume. Do you realize that assuming will get you in big trouble? Say, well, he's mad at me. How do you know? Well, I just assume that they are. And I'm telling you what, when you assume, it's always worse than it really is. So today, being Superhero Sunday, I want to talk to you about a year of no excuses. Amen? Oh, man, I felt a cold wind blow up here. Some of y'all, oh, no, where are we going to go with that today? And I want you to know that if there's ever been a time for the children of God to rise up, it's in the year 2021, amen? And the gifts and callings that God has placed in your life are for now. They're not for later, they're for now. You say, I don't care if you're 10 years old. I thank God mom and dad, I was 8 years old when God gave me the opportunity to preach my first sermon. I thank God when I came to them and felt compelled to preach that my dad said, no, you got to wait 10 years. He said, get up there and get ready. And I still, Sister Kelly, I found my notes for my first sermon. It's like, it's like three lines. I think I preached for two minutes and 50 seconds was all that I preached that first time. Somebody say, preacher, I wish you'd go back to your old ways. <laughs> hey, Amen. I, I have that in a, little, in a little plaque, the first notes out of John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. So I don't care where you are in your life. I don't care about your past. I don't care how many times you've messed up. I don't care how many bad decisions you've made in your life. We have something that we like to say around here, and there's not hardly a week goes by that I don't say it, but we don't care where you've been, only where you're going. You can't control yesterday or anything that happened yesterday. The only thing that you can control, my friend, is right now, and the decisions that you make right now to change the path that you are on, whether it's good or whether it's bad, whether it's pretty or whether it's ugly, you have an opportunity and a chance to make things better than they've ever been before. And I'm telling you, if that's something that you're looking forward to doing today, I recommend a man by the name of Jesus Christ who lived a sinless life, died on a hill called Calgotha. He was buried and raised from the third day, and now he's seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and for me. I recommend him in your life today, amen? But in the Bible, in Exodus chapter 3, verse number 11, I, I want to read just one quick, quick scripture in one verse here in the Old Testament. You got Genesis and Exodus. It's the second book, the third chapter. It's very, very, very short. Exodus chapter 3, verse 11. If you're there, say amen. 
But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I shall bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? I want you to look at that person next to you while you're sitting down and say, Who am I? You may be seated. Thank you for being reverent today. We think about excuses. Old song, old uh, southern gospel song in the 80s, it was a song called Excuses, Excuses We Hear Them Every Day. Some of y'all old timers might remember that. When did excuses begin? Excuses began in the very first family that ever lived upon this planet, a man by the name of Adam and a woman by the name of Eve who did things that they were not supposed to do. They ate of the tree that they were not supposed to eat, and God comes down in the cool of the day, and he says, where are you? They said, we're hiding. He said, why are you hiding? They said, we're naked. God said, how do you know you're naked? So Eve, or Adam, says to God, it was Eve's fault. Eve looks at God and says, it was the snake's fault. Amen? Amen? And God knew better than that, and he knew that they were making excuses, and there's things that we go through in life now, because every one of us, from the day we live, we start to die. Man, that's depressing when you think about it. I think about our families here today. I can't hardly look at some of you. Some of you buried your father this week. We, some of you buried your husband. Some of you buried your mother. I had three funerals in seven days, and my heart has been ripped out mentally it's the fatigue of just trying to help you and trying to encourage you and the prayers that I've prayed for you, plus other friends that I didn't officiate their funeral that had passed away. And I, I hate that we're going through it, and I hope that you're encouraged in the Lord today. And if there's people here that you know that are hurting, I hope that you'll just give them a hug today and let them know how much we love them and we're praying. Because you think you have it bad in your life. You didn't just bury your daddy three days ago. You didn't just bury your mother, and some of you can't handle the little things in life. What are you going to do when real adversity comes? How are you going to handle it? Amen. Amen. So we, we've got to talk about the excuses, and we want a year of no excuses. And here God looks at Moses, and the first point is, hey, he, his, the excuse could be, I'm living with my father-in-law. How many of you know, man, that, that wouldn't always be a good thing to have to live with your father-in-law. Can I get an amen in the house? Well, some of y'all about to shout back there. Wow. Feel the Spirit talking about that. He said, who am I? In the scripture that I read you today, God said there's over a million Israelites. They're God's chosen people. I've chosen you, Moses, to lead them out. He's like, what? Me? Why in the world would you choose me? Why in the world would you pick me out of all the millions of people around? I'm sitting here on the backside of a desert, on the side of a mountain, taking care of my father-in-law's sheep. I don't have anything to give. I don't even know who my daddy is. If you know the story of Moses, he was raised in Pharaoh's house. He didn't was raised by his mother. wasn't raised by his father. He didn't know these things. And God says, I'm picking you. And there's some of you sitting here today. You know God has called you to do things. He's given you gifts in your life. And you're sitting there just like Moses saying, what? Me? How can it be me? My family's not the, a royal family. My family's not a bunch of preachers. I've had adversity in my life. And he looked and he said, God, why in the world? I'm living with my father-in-law. Then in Exodus chapter 4, verse number 1, then Moses said, answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, the Lord has not appeared unto you. He's trying to make excuses, just like some of you. First he says, Psh, my family's not where it needs to be. He says, what if I get up and say something and they don't listen to me? What if they don't believe? Honey, let me tell you something. As a preacher, there's people that are dying and going to hell that listen to a sermon every week. And if I base my ministry on the success rate in the altar, I wouldn't do this thing because there's a lot of people that won't submit to the call of God and they won't submit to conviction in their life. And you know what? It hurts sometimes when you look back and you see people that need God, but I can't come and get you. You've got to make that step on your own. I can't let my success be on the response. I've got to go on and do what God wants me to do, even if nobody responds. 
even if nobody likes the song you're singing, even if your kids in your class aren't listening to everything you say, you got to go on because you're planting seed in their life that might come back later. And you and may, somebody else may come and water it and it begin to blossom because of the seed that you've planted in your life. So he says, Psh, I ain't got the family. What if they don't listen to me? And then he said in verse number 10 of chapter 4, Then Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. I don't know exactly what that means, because there's people that listen to us and the way we talk in southeast Kentucky, and they think... They talk about our accent and maybe how we talk like mashed potatoes are in our mouth or maybe we talk a little slow. Maybe he was tongue-tied. Maybe he just couldn't get things out. So now he's making an excuse. God, they're not going to listen to me because I can't even talk right. Hey, Amen. Some of you think I can't get up in front of people. I can't do anything because I don't have the word. Honey, when you yield to the anointing of the Holy Ghost, it ain't you speaking anymore because he that is within you is greater than he that is within the world. My words mean nothing. But the anointing of God brings our words to life. People come to me all the time, Pastor, I love that man. I love it when you said this and you said that. I'm thinking, I don't even remember saying that. Where did that come from? It didn't come from me. It came from God. So here's Moses, the first one there that we see in Exodus, making all these excuses. I'm living with my father, father-in-law. And then we can go to the next excuse. I'm too young. I don't have enough experience in my life. I, I, I need to wait till I get a little bit older. Some of the saddest people that I ever spend time with in my life are people that come to the end of their life They get into their 80s, late 70s, and their life is full of regret because they never reached the potential that God had for them. They always made excuses year after year after year after year. And there'll come a time when you think you're too young and then you're going to wake up one day and you're going to realize you're too old and you've missed everything that God has for you. And we can base that on the scripture in Jeremiah chapter 1 when Jeremiah declared the word of the Lord and the Lord came to me saying in verse number 4 before I formed you in the womb I knew you before you were born I sanctified you and I ordained you a prophet to the nations verse number 6 then said I O Lord God behold I cannot speak because I am a youth but the Lord said to me do not say I am a youth for ye shall go to all to whom I send you and whatever I command you you shall speak Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, saith the Lord. Verse number 9, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, and you can go on and read later what he said there. He said, do not be afraid of their faces. Those of you that are on the stage singing can understand that when you're looking back at the people's faces sometimes, it doesn't look too pleasant. You can see, I've seen people balancing their checkbooks in the middle of my sermon. I've seen arguments break out between spouses in the middle of my sermon. And I can see them start jawing at each other. Right in the middle of the... I have had people cut their fingernails in the middle of my sermons. (laughs) You think that could be distracting? You guys know how much ADHD, whatever it's called. You know, I don't even know the initials. And man, I'm trying to preach my heart out and I'm looking back and seeing people fighting and cut. My goodness, what's going to happen now? They're going to pull their toes out, start cutting their toe now. Going to bring a razor, start shaving your legs, shaving your armpits right in the middle of service. I wouldn't doubt it. The world and the lack of respect we live in today because parents aren't raising their kids and kids don't know how to act in church anymore. That's a different sermon. I'm living with my father-in-law. I'm too young. Another excuse the devil likes to give you. I'm too old. Amen. Think of Abraham. Think of Sarah. God speaks to Abraham, said, you're going to be the father of all nations. You can pick up the sand from a beach, and that will not even number the descendants that are in your life. How many of you know that's a lot? 
And you think about Abraham, man, he could have been pumped up about it. He could have been excited. But listen to his response in Genesis chapter 17, verse number 17. After God speaks to Abraham and tells him this thing. Abraham, verse number 17 of chapter 17. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed. And said in his heart, shall I child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Woo! I don't know about you, but that'd probably be on Facebook. Somebody 98 years old winding up getting pregnant by a hundred year old man. That might make the top ten. I don't know how it is. And you might laugh just like Abraham. And he's thinking, wow. And what did Abraham do? They begin to get impatient with God because they didn't want to wait with God. When God gave him the promise and his wife comes to him and said, hey, there's this good looking chick over here that, that washes our dishes and makes macaroni and cheese for us and pepperoni pizza. And uh, she's a good looking girl and she's young. Why don't you just go on and sleep with her and have a child and that'll be the one. And Abraham says, Okay. Are you sure? Is this a trick, Sarah? Man, I could preach a sermon right there. And he went on, and Ishmael, the illegitimate son of Abraham's born. And if you go to this day to Iraq, you see the people going crazy over there and hating us and calling us infidels. It's all because Abraham tried to put the will of God in his hand and he tried to do it himself. You don't need to work it out. You don't need to work out the details. You just need to be a willing vessel and let God move in your life. We've got too many Ishmaels trying to run the church. And we need some Isaacs that will raise up on people who wait upon the Lord. I'm living with my father-in-law. I'm too young. I'm too old. And the last one today that I'll share with you, I'm unworthy. Man, Pastor Larry, thank you for what you said. It was just confirmation of what the Lord was giving me today. Thank you for obeying God. Angie, thank you for the words you shared today. You ever feel like you don't deserve it? I tell you all the time, if I had what I deserved, I'd have been in hell a long time ago. I don't deserve to be your pastor. I don't deserve the blessings that God has given me. I'm a man that stands before you that understands the power of restoration and has tried many a time in his sleep. Create in me a new heart, O God, and renew a right spirit. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord. Renew a right spirit in me. None of us are worthy. We don't worship God because we're worthy. As D always says, we worship God because he's worthy. The only one that brings up your past should be the devil. I told people a couple weeks ago they were being persecuted and talked about for things that they'd been through in their life in the past and criticized. And I told them, I said, honey, just understand the only people ever going to talk about you are church people, so-called Christians. Because people that are dying and going to hell could care less what you've been through in your past. People that are hungry, they don't, can you feed me? Well, wait just a minute, i got to tell you, i done this in 87, I did this in 1999, 2004 was a horrible year. No, their belly's growling, they just need something to eat. We can turn to the book of Isaiah, and we can find ourselves in the shoes of Isaiah many times. And there are some of you right now this morning on Superhero Sunday, Sunday in a year of no excuses, I'm living with my father-in-law. I'm too young. I'm too old. Saying that you're unworthy. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse number 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, this is Isaiah speaking, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each, listen to these angels. This is the angel that he's, spread, that he's describing. The angel had six wings, two that covered his face, two that covered his feet, and two in which he flew. 
And one cried to the other from the other side of the throne of God and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The earth is full of his glory. Honey, if you're uncomfortable worshiping God down here on this earth, I hate to tell you, but Isaiah just told us there's seraphim angels 24 hours a day, seven days a week standing before the throne of God. And the only thing that they ever say in their life is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Honey, if you don't like to worship God down here, you're not going to enjoy heaven at all. Because when I see him, I will be at his feet. I will dive at his ankles. And I will thank him for everything that he's done for me. And I will praise him. And I will worship him. And I will say, worthy art thou, O God. Blessed art thou, O God. And I will praise him every day that I have in my life. I tell our team we can make a conscious decision when we come to the church and we come to worship God and we come in the house of God. And I tell my kids and I tell my leadership, I won't let anybody out worship me. I won't let anybody out praise me. I will praise God no matter what I'm going through, no matter what I'm feeling through in my life. And if somebody beside you gets a little excited and starts dancing a little bit, don't you judge them. You don't know the hell that they've been through in their life. And you don't know what God's done for them. And instead of criticizing them, you should say, Lord, bless them anyway. I'm about to shout right now. Somebody say, God is good. good. Here's the angels around the throne of God crying, holy, holy, holy. We can pick up at verse number 4 of Isaiah chapter 6. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone, unclean, unworthy, undeserving. Isaiah wakes up and he he realizes that he's in the presence of God and the train of his robe fills the temple. The seraphims are singing and all of a sudden the house begins to shake and smoke fills it. And he says, whoa, wait a minute. I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time. Honey, there's some of you that have sat in this worship service today thinking, where in the world am I? Hey, you're right where God wants you to be. You're saying, whoa, whoa. He said, whoa, here in verse number five. For I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King the Lord of hosts do you ever feel that way I'm unworthy you seen these people that I live with you met my cousin I'm a man of unclean lips And I hang out and live around unclean people. And I don't even know why I'm here. Then one of the seraphim, one of the angels, flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken from the tongs from the altar. It was hot fire from God. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, and this is what I hear God speaking to you today. The same message that was spoken to Isaiah hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. As God looks at our nation that is in chaos, He looks at our young people that no longer understand whether they're male or female. He looks at our marriages. He looks at our relationships. He looks in our bank account. He looks at our life and he looks at everything we are and even though we feel we are unclean, unworthy, undeserving, 
when you get a touch from the coal from heaven and it touches you, it'll change you and you'll never be the same. And the fire of God touched Isaiah and he heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Who will help me feed the hungry in this dry county? Who will help me clothe the ones that are freezing to death, that don't have a coat to wear tonight or a blanket to keep them warm? Who will help me train up a child in the way that they should go, that when they're old they won't depart from it? Who will go before us? You see, some of you, if you can't stand behind this podium or on this stage, you don't think that you can do anything. Honey, the most important people in restoration never step on this stage. They work and they clean the bathroom and they bring our kids to church and they lay their hands on them and pray over them and love them and they bless them and they never get any recognition. Let me tell you something, honey. Your reward will be in heaven. Amen. For what you do for God. Everyone can't hold the microphone. Who shall I send? And who will go for us? And here's Isaiah, who felt so unclean, unworthy, undeserved. In the presence of God, to take the tongs from the altar and he put the coal on his lips. And he hears the voice of God speaking to him. And he says in verse number eight. In the very end, then I said, here am I, send me. The Lord didn't speak at this point and say, I need to know what theological cemetery you went, or excuse me, seminary you went to. I, I need to know how many failed relationships you've had in your life. He didn't say, wait a minute, I need to know who the baby daddy is. He didn't say, I need to check your banking account. He simply looked for a willing vessel that was willing to do whatever God wanted him to do. Listen, you know my mommy and daddy are ministers. I've been in this thing all my life. I remember when I was a youth pastor, my responsibility was to drive the church van, pick up some of your kids, clean the bathroom, vacuum the sanctuary, vacuum the pews, clean up the garbage. And I remember how blessed I was when I was able to, to bring home $150 a week and work 60 or 70 hours for God every week with everything that was within me. Some of you make that a day. I remember when I came became principal of Corbin Christian Academy, Amanda, our principal of restoration, was one of my students. I was her principal. Now she's the principal of our Christian school. It was a small school, and even coming out with the education that I had and all that, Dad said, "Son, you don't know. You know we don't have enough money, a lot of money, but I'll give you a place to live and three hundred dollars a week, and that'll be your salary as a principal." And man, I loved every minute. By the way, you still got to run the church van and help clean the church. I've paid my dues. I've 
worked hard to have what God's given me. You know, we've got these men's league and these youth leagues for the kids. And here in a few minutes after we finish, you guys will all leave. There'll be two or three that'll stay behind, and we have to stack every one of these chairs and get them out of here. It amazes me. I'll watch some adults that have strong backs walk right out the door and never offer to help. We were here last night. Everything gets done. From the leagues, from the week, we had to set the sanctuary back up. These, this, this, this stage is in three pieces, and we have to get it back up here. There's four men and three ladies that were here to help set everything back up. Out of a church of 250 people, maybe 300 if everybody was here, there's that same handful of people that we know we can count on every time. Would you let 2021 be a year of no excuses? Would you quit feeling sorry for yourself for the bad things that have happened to you in your life and stand up and be the man or the woman that God would have you to be? Are you willing to serve? Are you willing to submit? There's some of you this morning, you need to be saved. You've made excuse after excuse after excuse whether you should make things right with God. It's a year of no excuses. How about today being the day that you make everything right with God and you find peace in your life? There's some of you that may have been saved at an earlier age, but you've ran and you've ran hard. And you need restoration. And you need to rededicate your commitment to God. How about today? How about 2021 being a year of no excuses? And there are some of you that are faithful members of this church. We thank God for you. And there are some of you that need to be more faithful. You see, I tell you this all the time. When I look at Leanna, I can't say, honey, I am faithful to you most of the time. Right? Out of this year, 365 days, I was faithful to you, 362 of them. Let's not worry about the other three days. How many of you think that would fly well in our marriage? You are either faithful or you're not. There's not kind of faithful. There's not sometimes faithful. You are either faithful or you're not. faithful in your tithe and your offering to support your, the ministries of the church because you don't take the phone calls every week when people call me and say, you don't know how many times we have to get together where, where our principals chipped in 20 bucks, somebody else chipped in 20 bucks, let's try to get a motel for these people tonight, it's cold, they don't have anywhere to go, their cars broke down on the side of the interstate and they went in McDonald's and said, I don't know anybody in this town that will help you but I know Ronnie Smith will help you. It ain't me, it's you. And there's times I can't help people because we don't have the funds. Because you know, if we have it, I'm giving it away. It ain't sitting in there. We'll bless somebody, we'll plant another church, we'll start another ministry, man. We're going to do everything that we can. But that starts with you being faithful. Where do you stand today? in your faithfulness into your calling do you feel like Isaiah do you feel like Abraham do you feel like Jeremiah do you feel like Moses well honey these men went on to be some of the most prominent people that we ever read of in the Bible and led thousands and thousands of people to the Lord and thousands of years later we're still talking about them not because the excuses that they made, but because there came a time, there came a service, there came an opportunity when they said, no more excuses. And that's where you are today. No more excuses. I'm asking you if you please would.
Would you stand all over the building? And would you take just one moment?